morning and a, and a very warm welcome uh, from my side to our today's morning briefing on geopolitical challenges. Um, my name is Leonie Stamm. I'm a research fellow here at DJAP, and I am very much looking forward to be moderating today's session. We will be discussing a very typical topical issue today, the European political community. Today is the 6th of October, and in a few hours, we will see a gathering in Prague of a kind of an unusual kind, about 44 heads of state and government will get together for the first meeting of the EPC, the European Political Community. This new political grouping includes the EU member states, as well as countries seeking accession, such as Ukraine and Moldova, but also states outside of the EU, such as the UK. It was first represented, uh, or at least in this framework, by Emmanuel Macron in his speech in May this year, referring to the idea of a European Confederation by François Mitterrand. He presented the idea as a new space for political cooperation, security, and also cooperation in the fields of energy, infrastructure, etc. He then officially presented the idea at the meeting of the European Council. It was then endorsed by Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union speech in September. And now here we are. Aim of this project is to, to provide a policy coordination platform for European dialogue and cooperation beyond the European Union, also triggered by the current um, geopolitical situation and the current events we see with the Russian war against Ukraine. It has been at the beginning quite vague, um, but the idea has been taken into different directions um, with different countries also having different ideas, expectations, but maybe also concerns um, on questions or uh, if it will be an accelerator for EU accession, or if it will slow down the process, will it be another informal forum, or should it be where the institution lies? But I think the biggest question of all is, um, will the EPC be, be a watershed moment for, for the future of the Europe and EU enlargement, or will it not? We do have a stellar panel with us, and I'm very delighted uh, to, to welcome our today's speakers to answer all those questions and to go into the discussion. We have Jean Pisani Ferry with us. Jean, you are a senior fellow at Bruegel, the think tank you have co-founded uh, in 2005. You have then led Bruegel until 2013 as director. You're a non-resident fellow um, at the Peterson Institute, Washington, and you had several positions in the French government, such as the Commissioner General of France Stratégie. And you were working as a director of program and ideas of Emmanuel Macron's campaign in 2017. Very warm welcome to you. Christy Reich, we, we have, uh, I'm more than delighted to welcome you here as well. You, you are the director of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at the International Center for Defense and Security. And we are very much looking forward also to this perspective. You have been the senior research fellow and acting program director at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs in Helsinki. You just told us that you're actually calling also in from Helsinki. Um, you've been official at the General Secretariat at, of the Council of the EU in Brussels, and I'm very much looking forward to hear your perspective on the EPC, yeah, from the security side and also the regional perspective. And last but not least, we have with us Guntram Wolf. Guntram, you are the director of the JAP, so our director since August this year. And right before, you have been the um, di director of Brügge between 2013 and 2022. So we do have actually today the excellence of two former Brügge directors here uh, at our panel. And we are very much looking forward to that. Before I will hand over to our speakers, a few housekeeping words. Um, we will hear short introduction statements from our speakers. And then we would like to dive into the discussion with our guests. So please 
be prepared. Uh, we are very much looking forward to your questions to be able to answer as many questions as possible. Please limit yourself to about one minute and kindly direct your questions to, to one or several of our speakers so that I don't have to choose who to make answer those questions. And uh, as my German teacher always used to say, a question always ends with a question mark. And last disclaimer, um, as usual with our morning briefings, this session is on record and is actually also being recorded. So please be aware of that. Before I hand over for a short seven minutes introductory statements, I would like to kick us off with the very first question round. Um, so question to every one of our speakers, maybe in a short one minute answer, looking at the EPC summit today, how did we actually get here? Why the relevance of such format now? Maybe Jean, maybe you would like to start. Well, thank you for, for having me again. Uh, I think the, the, the relevance um, is, is clearly not related so much to this old idea of the European Confederation, which was really at uh, very different times. We're in a, in a, in a situation of uh, uh, high tension in Europe. We're in a situation in which the, uh, the EU has made the um, bold move and, and um, very welcome move of granting uh, accession candidate status to uh, Ukraine and Moldova. <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, we know that uh, those processes take time. Uh, and, and really there is a conundrum uh, between speeding up uh, the enlargement uh, and ensuring also that the, uh, the EU can reform itself and that candidate countries meet the criteria. So I think um, this is a, the, the context in which this, uh, this uh, summit is taking place. Uh, and, um, and that's the reason also why the expectation can be, can be high. I mean, uh, uh, will uh, the heads of state and government be able to raise to the challenge and, uh, and really respond to all the questions that are, that are being asked? Perfect. Thank you very much. Chrissy, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, good morning uh, to everyone. I will put it this way, we are uh, at the moment of uh, systemic change in European security and even more broadly international security. Uh, the post-Cold War security order is broken and we don't quite yet see what is going to emerge uh, to replace it. But I see uh, the EPC as one of the initiatives uh, that is now starting to you know, shape the emergence of uh, new structures. And uh, I remain a bit skeptical as to how important part uh, the EPC is going to be in the new structure, but I think it is an important uh, effort uh, to show that uh, there is Europe beyond the EU and uh, an effort to bring all these European countries, also non-EU European countries together uh, in this uh, uh, time of uh, fierce geopolitical competition globally and to show that Europe can be uh, united on some important uh, security issues or at least have a common agenda. Wonderful, thanks. Guntram, some last words. Well, I mean, there, I think we are already seeing some convergence of topics. So I'm, I'm quite, uh, quite in agreement with my two previous speakers. And I think this is a moment for um, the uh, heads of state of government uh, of uh, 27 EU countries plus 40 non-EU countries, but all European countries to actually come together and uh, and think and discuss and agree on what are the next steps um, in this critical geopolitical moment. And I think the, the key issues certainly are the security situation, but they, they are also about sanctions. They are also about financial support. They're about um, what can we do to 
uh, ensure um, the financing and the military support that Ukraine needs um, um, and, and so on and so forth. So it's really, I think, a strong signal that all of these um, heads of state and government actually come together and and speak uh, to each other um, and of course the one that is clearly missing and deliberately missing is of course um, Russia and uh, and and Be Be Belarus and so so in that sense it's a clear alliance also that is being formed here thank you very much I think we have heard already many points we will get back to but First of all, I would like to hand over to you, Jean, um, for your introductory statement. We are especially happy um, to hear your input because you have just published um, a policy brief, uh, among others, also with Daniela Schwarzer and our colleague Shaheen Valle, um, enlarging and deepening, giving substance to European political community. So hereby I hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, we, we published this paper because uh, we thought that, you know, there was this, this project uh, about uh, uh, having a summit of the European political community without uh, actually knowing exactly what, you, what it meant. And uh, uh, this is a concept and there can be many things behind this concept. So we, we thought it useful to, you know, put into the debate some ideas about uh, what it uh, it can be and what it uh, it should be. It's, it's more a normative paper than a paper about uh, you know discussing uh, the the options. Um, let me let me say a few words about what what we know of the of the actual uh, summit. So uh, um, there will be forty three or forty four participants. Uh, so very wide participation. I fully agree with Guntram. The message and the strong message is basically everybody but Europe and uh, but, uh, but Russia and Belarus, which is a very strong statement in the current uh, situation, and a very welcome uh, actually uh, statement of you know at least some degree of unity among those uh, participating. Um, it's uh, the indication that the EU is not a factor of division uh, in Europe. It's a, it's a factor of, uh, of unity. And, um, and even countries that have uh, recently left the, the EU, like the, the UK, are, are very eager to, to participate and be, uh, really play a role in the discussion. Turkey is participating. Um, the, so, so that is uh, perhaps the first message about this, uh, this meeting, uh, show of, of, of unity. Now, the, the second message is a, is a show of concreteness. Um, as I understand, they will be discussing two issues mainly. Uh, one is peace and security, and the other one is energy and climate. Those are two issues of major uh, immediate uh, relevance of major importance. And we actually uh, proposed in, uh, in our papers that um, um, the, the PC should be really centered on those two issues without excluding possibly other, uh, other topics or the fields of, of cooperation, but really starting very concretely, not with institutions, not with you know, anything having to do with the traditional way of uh, of the EU of uh, discussing, uh, first of all, what the EU is about and uh, what are the governance problems, etc. But really, uh, uh, much more problem solving oriented. Um, and, uh, and there are emergency issues that in both cases have a non-EU dimension. It very clearly energy, uh, you know, uh, we have we have Norway, uh, major provider of, of natural gas. We have Turkey. Uh, we have uh, countries that are part of the of the European uh, energy system that are partially or completely interconnected with the uh, with the EU. And really, this this question of um, of energy security is absolutely central, um, uh, as well actually as uh, as climate, because this is a field in which in which uh, Europe is, is broadly uh, broadly united, especially if compared to the rest of the world. The other part is uh, peace and security, and 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 here clearly, uh, you know, uh, 
the, 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 the the war in Ukraine and the alliance to support Ukraine is, is much broader than, than the EU and uh, uh, even obviously the, the US is playing a, a leading role in this, in this regard. So, so this also is a, is a field where there should be, um, there should be a bit of learning from the various participants. And actually, it is important uh, also uh, to have this issue being discussed because uh, I think we all learn from, from the Ukraine. We all learn from uh, the, the, uh, the extraordinary behavior of the uh, Ukrainian troops on, on the ground and, and the ability to sort of, you know, uh, gain uh, success victories uh, against what was regarded as a as a major, almost invincible uh, army. So, so it is important in this regard, and this is also an indication that the EPC is not a sort of, a, uh, you know, one-way uh, street uh, in which uh, some countries have to learn from those who are already part of the EU. Now, um, these these are important uh, dimensions. The question I think we have to ask is um, this is good to discuss the issues, but uh, how uh, does it uh, square with the, um, the enlargement process with you know, other dimensions of the European uh, integration that uh, are, have started um, and uh, that will certainly uh, continue? And in this regard, um, uh, what we're putting forward in the, in the, in the paper it's first the idea that uh, the EPC and enlargement should not be regarded as alternatives. They should be regarded really as complement to each other. Um, and the uh, EPC will be, will be useful if it supports also the, the, the drives towards um, uh, EU enlargement uh, and the, the, the process that uh, has started. It will also, and this is something that's clearly not part of the, of the current agenda, but it should also be regarded as a way uh, to sort of speed up the, the internal reforms of the EU, which are at present, the lack of, of which is at present an obstacle to enlargement. Chancellor Schultz said very clearly in his speech in, in Prague a few weeks ago that an EU uh, that would enlarge without reforming itself would really be ineffective, would be would be paralyzed in a way by uh, institutions that were built for a much smaller EU and not for a EU of, let's say, 36 members. Um, so the two processes have to move in parallel. And we regard the, the PC um, as a way also to experiment in some fields and to accelerate the process of uh, EU, EU reform. So, um, the question really, the, the fundamental question for, for the future of the EPC is, what does it mean to have a, a European political community with an elephant inside and the elephant being the EU? Um, and uh, how, uh, how will uh, it, it work? The, the, the thinking um, at present is that the G7, G20 uh, model will be very much a template for the functioning of the EPC. Um, but what I regard and what we regard uh, as, a, as, a, as an obstacle in, in this respect is the fact that the, the G7 and the G20, they, they give political guidance uh, to a number of uh, institutions. So we have, when we have a G7 or a G20 summit, it gives guidance uh, to the IMF, to the World Bank, to the WTO, to the OECD, to the Stability Forum, or to you know, other, um, just using here the economic institutions. Um, but um, uh, so, and, and then the, the mandate, the, the mission is, is uh, taken uh, over by those, uh, uh, institutions, uh, specialized institutions with a specific mandate, and they carry it forward. And they report to the 
next G20 or G7 uh, summit. This template doesn't work in the case of Europe and cannot work. Uh, we, we have a, a lack of, um, uh, we don't have this density of, of institutions uh, and we have the EU. Uh, so I think the, the question of what should be the relationship between the EU and the EPC cannot be ignored and should not be ignored. What we're saying is that um, all countries should be participating on equal footing they shouldn't be second-class citizens. Um, some of those uh, the countries participating will are and will remain uh, candidates. Um, the, the participation in the EPC should be a way to accelerate uh, their membership. Some of them uh, will not, uh, and certainly this is the case of the UK, will not uh, become members in, in, in the future. Um, and, and, and for them, uh, the EPC uh, you know, should be a way to structure their relationship with a continent that is dominated de facto by, by the EU. Mm -hmm. So those problems cannot be ignored. Uh, we making a number of proposals uh, around flexibility, around soft law. I can go back to them, but I, I wanted to, to sort of emphasize uh, those dimensions to start with. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm sure we will get back um, later to many of those points, and I will restrict myself to, to ask follow-up questions, even if I would have a lot. But I will hand over to you, Christy. I think it's a good, um, uh, uh, good moment to hand over to you to hear your perspective um, and your view on, on the EPC, um, also with a special look um, from security and, and the region. The floor is yours. Um, thank you. This is a fascinating uh, discussion, and we are at the birth of this new structure and, and many questions uh, about what it is actually going to focus on, what it can be expected to deliver. Um, looking a bit uh, back uh, at uh, how this idea uh, came about when it was uh, presented by President uh, Macron in this uh, spring. Uh, as you know, the initial reaction from um, many Central and Eastern and also Northern uh, European countries was uh, very skeptical because it was uh, seen uh, as an attempt to, to present an alternative uh, to enlargement. Well, this, this, this concern was then uh, um, quickly kind of dissipated and, and uh, of course so the fact that uh, the EU did uh, give candidate country status to Ukraine and Moldova uh, very clearly shows that this uh, commitment to enlargement is there and uh, it has been made very clear that uh, the EPC is not meant to be um, a substitute to enlargement. So this is, uh, this is important for, for a large number of uh, uh, countries. Uh, but when I look at uh, the discussions on then what is the purpose and, and uh, what could be the aims of the APC, I'm still puzzled about how strongly enlargement uh, is uh, part of these uh, discussions. Um, because the APC is this very broad Forum, including uh, countries with a very different uh, relationship to the EU, members, candidate countries, and then countries that are uh, not going to become uh, members. And um, I still struggle to, to understand uh, why do we need to kind of, um, frame the EPC as a bridge to enlargement or, or as an accelerator to enlargement, because in my view, um, we should, in the EU, um, develop the enlargement policy as enlargement policy. And uh, it is um, uh, Ukraine's EU accession in future that is one of the uh, geopolitically most uh, critical questions for the future of European security. Uh, this is uh, of really huge importance uh, for, for how uh, the European security order will take shape um, after uh, the war in, in Ukraine. And, and um, it is uh, Ukraine's path to membership that can really 
send this very clear message to Russia that um, Russia's attempt to impose its uh, sphere of influence on neighboring countries by force is something that is not uh, accepted. Uh, it actually cannot happen. And uh, also it is uh, important in, for our like, longer term relationship to uh, Russia. So if Ukraine becomes uh, successfully integrated to Europe as a democratic nation, uh, this will in the longer term uh, be a very important uh, example for Russia uh, as to how um, an Eastern European country can actually develop. But then uh, bringing the EPC to this uh, picture, um, I think uh, creates confusion. This, I, as I said, enlargement should be developed as enlargement, enlargement policy. There are many ways to revitalize it, not only for Ukraine and Moldova, but also for the uh, Western Balkans candidate countries uh, that have been waiting for, for a long time. Um, uh, it's, um, I think, uh, necessary to um, develop a kind of more staged process with different steps and uh, different paths of uh, already partially sectorally integrating the candidate countries and also uh, to develop the kind of uh, both positive and negative conditionality mechanisms uh, as part of the enlargement policy. But this has really nothing to do with the EPC in my view. Um, but where I see the value of the EPC, uh, as I said in the beginning, is in this uh, current uh, geopolitical um, environment, not just in Europe, but also globally, um, with uh, this uh, really um, tense competition between major players and uh, Europe looking for its uh, place in this uh, competition and, and um, um, the value of them bringing European countries uh, together to discuss their common uh, security challenges, energy challenges. Uh, this is important. This is the value of, of EPC. And, and uh, it's, it's not, I think, uh, as important for engaging Ukraine as it is for uh, engaging those countries that are not on the path to to membership, uh, such as the UK and, and Turkey. And then also smaller countries, Norway, for example, is quite uh, keen to have this uh, platform to meet with the uh, leaders of uh, major or all European uh, countries, uh, Norway being outside uh, the EU. Um, uh, it does not um, have uh, as many opportunities uh, to meet uh, with, with uh, European leaders. Um, and of course, this point about uh, excluding Russia is hugely important. And I think the EPC is a step towards um, creating this common understanding in Europe that uh, we cannot have a shared understanding with Russia on European security order for many years to come. Uh, the differences are just too deep uh, when it comes to um, how Russia sees uh, uh, the preferred uh, kind of organizing principles of uh, European security and what is the view in, in the rest of Europe. Of course, there is also a deep cleavage between um, political systems, Russia having become totalitarian. Um, so um, once we acknowledge that this is not the time to look for uh, a new understanding on European security order with Russia, that this is uh, just uh, not feasible for the time being, uh, it is uh, important to strengthen uh, the security structures in Europe uh, that help us uh, uh, defend against uh, the threat of uh, Russia and defend uh, the principles of European security that are important uh, to, to us and that uh, Russia has been uh, violating. And, and the EPC is, is one part of uh, this picture, uh, but of course it's uh, uh, NATO and the European Union that uh, have the most important uh, uh, role here as, as the kind of uh, Western security structures that uh, 
take care of European security. And Ukraine has to be integrated to both the EU and NATO in future um, in order to, um, to have uh, sustainable security in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for for um, this uh, this input and um, yeah we have a lot to discuss. I will directly hand over to you, Guntram, um, <coughs> our German also speaking in this round. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah. The next seven minutes, uh, I can see already our questions coming in. So the next seven minutes are yours. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, I think the EPC should really be about um, a show of alliance, um, a forging of consensus among heads of state and governments, and less about uh, about institutions, um, as some would like to see it. Um, and let me be um, really make make three three quick points. Um, the first one is that. Um, it really needs to be quite concrete um, at the moment. Um, at the moment, what is needed um, is weapon deliveries to Ukraine, um, it's financial support to Ukraine, um, it is um, uh, an enlargement of the security umbrella to Eastern Europe. It is concrete action that is needed, much more than um, abstract institutions um, that, uh, that will be built and so, in that sense, I really think the discussion today, um, and I think there was a question by, by James Willey on that, uh, the discussion should really be um, quite concrete on what can we do to ensure um, that the security um, of Eastern Europe um, in particular uh, can, be, can be guaranteed. Um, and so, so, so that would be my first point. So, so focus on concrete issues. Um, and and don't get lost in in institutional uh, sort of debates. Um, having said that, I, I do share Christie's uh, worry um, that there is quite a little, quite a blurry institutional sort of discussion around. Um, and um, I, I think, I mean, if we take the two two the two topics, um, energy and climate. Um, as well as uh, foreign and security policy, of course, there is a lot of EU institutional action in that space. Um, and um, in both um, EU institutions actually do take very concrete decisions. Um, in climate, it's obvious we have the European Green Deal in energy. Well, energy ministers just met last week and took very concrete decisions. And when it comes to common foreign security policy, we all know that, um, of course, there are major obstacles to, to coming to decisions, but still, I mean, there are fora, um, EU fora, and there are EU decisions, and sanction policy is, is not discussed in the EPC. It's discussed um, in, the, in the European, uh, uh, in the Council and in the European Council. So, so in that sense, um, I think we need to be very careful uh, not to uh, really um, make, mess up EU processes um, in, in such a wide gathering. The wide gathering can be about forging alliance and the EU has to be a motor there and France, Germany and the EU institutions need to really uh, push consensus um, and ideally be the driver of um, of the, the policy consensus and the, the political consensus emerging in the EPC, but it cannot be the other way around. I mean, the, the core needs to be um, the EU institutions that actually, um, I, I would say, um, uh, have a very clear legal basis and actually take clear decisions um, and binding decisions. Um, so, so this is much more about alliance and political broad political consensus and not about interfere, it should not be about interfering in EU processes, just to be very clear on that point. And that brings me to my, my third point. Uh, I sometimes hear that it's, it's about um, the internal reform of the European Union. Um, so how do we move to, to qualified majority voting, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there, I have to say again, I don't think this is the right gathering for it. I mean, we are not going to discuss with uh, a country like like Azerbaijan uh, in the room uh, how we will we will move to a different um, 
voting system in the EU institutions. Um, I am worried, just to be very clear on that point also, that um, the European Parliament um, uh, is not properly um, involved, would not be properly involved in such a process. And I actually do think that um, the European Parliament has become a very important player and we need to not ignore but strengthen that European Parliament. The Euro let, let us remind, let us think back about the important role that the European Parliament played in the initial phase of the war in supporting Ukraine, in actually uh, being out there as a clear supporter towards the EU institutions and the European heads of state and government in accelerating um, the discussion on the accession process. So I think it would be a mistake uh, now to, to turn the turn turn it all around and come from a very big gathering and try to sort of from from that perspective uh, drive EU reform. Um, the EU reform um, has to primarily happen uh, within the EU. But again, I think it is it is good to to have a forum where these issues <clears throat> can be voiced um, in an informal way. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the, the most important dimension is really to form to form an alliance um, against against um, Russia and the current secu security situation, and come up with with very concrete um, support that will be most critically needed. So it's not institutions; it's at the moment it's really the political will um, that that uh, that counts. Thanks. Thank you, Guntram. Thanks a lot. Um, we will end with the political will. And uh, here I will open up our round to our audience. Uh, we already had a lot of questions coming in. I would um, like to, to invite you to also um, yeah, use the hand button to raise your voice if you would like to contribute with the question. I already have one question in, in the chat of Josef Janning, and I would um, also invite you to come in to uh, voice your question in person if you feel like. If Josef Janning is here, um, I kindly invite yes. you. Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. All right, okay. Now, with my question, I just wanted to point to, uh, uh, to some of the initial difficulties. That is, uh, a number of states uh, that will be participating today, they have their own agenda. You know, and they, uh, they may want to use the um, um, EPC uh, as, as part of their Schaukelpolitik, to use that German term for lack of a proper English one. Now, I, I ask myself, uh, you know, in, in this, at this stage, in this very uh, loose or very informal format, how can uh, the EPC uh, continue uh, this expression of uh, European solidarity in the face of Russia's aggression, while at the same time some of its participants uh, have their separate dealings with Russia. I'm thinking of Azerbaijan, of Turkey, uh, of Serbia in a way, uh, and are not participating uh, to the full extent uh, in Western policy uh, in light of that aggression. Yeah, I mean, just very quickly on that one, I wanted to reply, actually, I, I mean, I, I think this, to me, this meeting is also about telling, telling, telling off some of those countries that, uh, and basically telling them that this is not acceptable, right? Um, and, um, and I mean, that, by the way, this, this doesn't only concern uh, non-EU countries, it also concerns some EU countries. Um, and I think th those countries need to be told very clearly uh, from, uh, the large and vast majority of people that will come um, that, you know, it's it's just not acceptable and that that it will have um, eventually political consequences. I mean, that that's the way I would I would try to 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 frame this. But I, perhaps Christy wants to. Please come in. Yeah, well, actually, <clears throat> I very much uh, agree. And uh, building and strengthening European unity vis-a-vis -vis Russia, it's it's uh, a uh, never ending process, I think. There will always be some countries that are uh, less aligned, uh, some countries that have their own separate uh, relationships and dealings. But uh, I think this is uh, precisely one of the contributions that the EPC can make, that it actually tries to strengthen the unity and, uh, and um, 
kind of uh, brings uh, these countries that have their own agendas uh, into certain common positions, because this will be the key issue on the agenda now, how to further support, uh, increase support to Ukraine in order for Ukraine to win the war, um, how to enhance uh, military support, economic support, uh, how to uh, make sure the sanctions uh, work and uh, discuss how they can be further uh, strengthened or loopholes can be corrected. Um, so uh, to, to include uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan and Armenia, Ser Serbia in these discussions is important. And uh, if the APC then can come out with certain commonly expressed uh, positions that uh, um, show a stronger degree of uh, unity, I think this would be a great success of the APC. Thank you, Jean, please come in. Yeah, um, I, I think we all agree on the geopolitical significance of the meeting today. And we all agree on the concreteness, on the fact that uh, to have a focus on security uh, and the focus on energy and, and climate is a good way to start. Now, the, the, where we disagree and where problems uh, begin is precisely was uh, very rightly pointed out by Joseph Schianning. I mean, uh, you know, is it a sort of artificial show of unity um, uh, with countries uh, continuing to have a different agenda? Or will there be at some point a test uh, uh, of whether there is geopolitical alignment, uh, whether uh, there are common values uh, or, or not? So what we are proposing uh, in, the, in, the, in the paper is that there should be a declaration prepared, a, a sort of charter prepared, if you wish, um, uh, a process, and, and, and this process should be inclusive. It should not be driven by the EU. Um, it should be, you know, the, the drafting should be uh, delegated to a group of countries, um, some of which are in, within the EU, some of which are outside the EU. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there should be an agreement on a, a, a charter. Um, and, and this uh, may lead to some degree of clarification of where countries stand. I mean, they, it's not just, and it cannot be a place where all countries are welcome, whatever their behavior vis-a-vis, uh, -vis especially uh, Russia and, and the, the conflict in Ukraine, but, but sort of more broadly about, about values, about the rule of law, about democracy. Um, without this clarification, I doubt it will be a very useful way of uh, organizing the, uh, you know, the, the way the continent works. Thanks a lot. We have many, many hands raising. I will take my authority as a moderator to uh, always mix genders and um, uh, crash a bit in the order of, uh, of hand raising. I saw a mistaken nodding. Um, so I would, I would ask you to come in. Um, I will try to bundle questions. So I would uh, like to ask you to come in and then um, Elmar Brook as well. Kindly introduce yourself. And, uh, here you go. Yes, thank you. I'm uh, Sunda Tikin. Uh, I'm director at Institut für Europäische Politik. And uh, thank you for having organized this, uh, this discussion around this morning on this highly uh, relevant issue, I think. And it really also helps to clarify some, uh, some thoughts in my head, at least. Um, I think mo most of, uh, well, several points have already been raised. But uh, one thing what I really struggle with is actually and here I am more turning towards uh, the conceptual part of, of it again, because um, we have already discussed that there are so many um, countries with different relations and also expectations towards this elephant in the EPC, the, the European Union. So there are very diverse countries in, in this, this round. So my question really is, is the EPC meant to kind of add to the variable geometries of Europe or... Um, rather frame it in terms of, you know, bringing everyone around uh, around one table and putting a frame around the different 
um, variable uh, geometries that already exist uh, in Europe, because otherwise I think we really have to think about duplication of structures. So if, you know, if this is um, supposed to be sustainable, I think I find it rather interesting that uh, even the purpose has not been defined yet before the, the first uh, summit. I mean, this is of course an opportunity, but if it's supposed to be sustainable, I think we have to uh, think about structures and duplication of, um, of other institutions in order then to find a space for this EPC. So is it rather, you know, adding to the variable geometries or uh, framing it? This is something that I'm trying to wrap my head around. Thank you very much. Mr. Brook, would you like to come in as well? Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to say a few words. Uh, uh, I think uh, what was most important for me to say is everyone without Belarus, Russia, and Russia. It means it's OSCE without Russia and Belarus. Therefore, I believe that this is more the countries who still believe in uh, the international law sovereignty of nations and inter territorial integrity, and that such country can talk to each other, come to common grounds, but because of the diversity of the countries, I do not believe it comes to very concrete actions, but it's an important political assembly to show a certain understanding in this moment. I do not believe, otherwise I thought before, that this has to do with enlargement and instead of enlargement. The main reason for enlargements are member of the internal market, all that structures which gives profit to uh, future member countries. And I think therefore, because of the diversity of these countries, this will not be the case. So uh, it makes OECD on a political level workable because Russia and Belarusia uh, cannot disturb that the political discussions as a member. And I think that is, and uh, the last point is, it's good to have Britain in such a structure and Turkey at the same time, uh, but it will not have very practical results for the moment. Thank you very much. So we have the two questions and I would give them into, uh, into our round of panelists. We have the duplication of structures um, and also the diversity of countries. Maybe with the, we start with the structures. Who would like to come in on that? Maybe Jean. Okay, I can, I can start. Uh, I, I, I think we have to be clear about the, you know, enlargement. I mean, the, the, the decision to grant candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova was was very welcome. Um, the, we know from experience that the process of enlargement can be long, can be painful. Um, and in this case also can be delayed by the lack of the internal uh, EU reforms. So participation in the EPC is a way to give immediate concreteness to uh, the, the, the need to, to integrate those countries. Uh, it should not be a waiting room um, uh, in which for, for too long um, countries would remain. Uh, we know by experience that it's created enormous frustration. It can even lead to some backfiring uh, of, of good intentions to political uh, changes. Um, so uh, the way I think we should conceive the PC is really both as a, as a structure to, to, to integrate, as a way to uh, also experiment and as an accelerator of the, of, the, of the reforms, both actually the internal EU reforms and uh, also the reforms in the, in the candidate countries. So there is a degree of tension, uh, clearly. Uh, it, was, it was said 
that you know countries have very different agendas and it's clear that countries like the uk like turkey will not uh, become members of the eu so they're they're you know for some time the epc is a house with many different projects and eventually the epc is likely to become a sort of wider structure with countries that have no intention uh, and no perspective of, of joining the EU. But the, the problem cannot be just uh, ignored and uh, you, can't, you can't keep apart completely the enlargement process and the EPC because the EPC in a way is a, is a response to the urgency and to the lack of immediate perspective offered by the uh, enlargement process and the granting of candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova. If I may come in here, I think this is now an issue where we continue to have somewhat different perspectives, like what is or what should be the connection between enlargement and uh, the EPC. Uh, this, the way I see it is still that EPC is not about integrating countries to be part of EU institutions and EU policies and help them adopt uh, EU legislation. This is what the accession process is about. Uh, but this is not what is going to be worked on in the framework of uh, the EPC. And I, I also don't think that uh, Ukraine and Moldova are interested in EPC as uh, some sort of bridge to, to enlargement. No, they want to focus on enlargement and they can support EPC if it is very, very clear that it is not in any way uh, an alternative or substitute to, to enlargement. And I think it's also kind of uh, creating too high expectations or misleading expectations towards the EPC to say that it can help candidate countries to get closer to EU membership, um, since uh, uh, there are no such uh, structures or mechanisms uh, in the EPC initiative that uh, would actually have uh, that uh, purpose. Um, so when it comes to the question of uh, variable uh, geometry, the way I see it, uh, EPC is an intergovernmental structure, as Kuntram said, it's kind of alliance uh, building uh, exercise, um, but uh, it is very clearly like separated from uh, the EU institutions. And thus it is also separated, not just from enlargement, but uh, even more uh, from uh, the question of uh, internal EU reform. Uh, it's, it's uh, quite strange even to suggest that um, EU internal reform could somehow be advanced by bringing together uh, all these different uh, countries with uh, no intention to ever join the EU. We are not going to discuss with, with uh, the UK and Turkey about uh, how to uh, extend the use of uh, QMV or how to reform uh, the European Parliament or the European Commission. These are very important issues for the EU to be discussed among uh, member states. And then um, uh, just one more point on, on uh, security, uh, which uh, as we have discussed is, is the primary topic for the APC. Even here, we should not create too high expectations. I think the EPC is not going to be a structure that can enforce uh, the principles, key principles of European security. But what it can do is to, to, to endorse them, to, to you know, bring countries together and, and uh, say that we all agree that these principles are valid and we want to support them. But then for enforcement, uh, we have uh, other organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Guntram, would you like to come in or should we? Well, I mean, I can react also to some of the points in the in the chat and some of the questions in the chat. I mean, there there, there were questions: is it is is it a distraction, um, and shouldn't we focus on EU reform at the current moment? Um, 
uh, and you know what really do we achieve with this um, with this EPC and and you know there I, I would be a little bit less less skeptical than perhaps some of uh, those questions suggest I mean and and perhaps we'd be a bit closer to what what John has said I I, I do think there is value in heads of state and government um, coming together and actually talking to each other um, and you know uh, agreeing um, on some broad political principles and I think someone mentioned here the Council of Europe or Elmar Brook mentioned OSCE. OSCE. Um, I mean, I think these are um, values that are important to be to be reinforced in the current situation, and where you know it's important that actually people meet and discuss and agree that these principles remain important. And so, in that sense, I don't think it's a distraction at all. I think it's useful. Um, but I would be skeptical thinking that this, this is a way, uh, it can certainly cannot be a way of side passing the formal uh, enlargement process. And I don't think it's meant to be. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place where a lot of heads of state and government actually meet and discuss and, uh, and forge cons political consensus. Um, and the Ukraine, um, uh, I mean, Ukraine and the UK are both there, right? And yes, they have also bilaterally a lot to discuss, but they have a lot to discuss also together with with the EU from very different perspectives. And so, so I would see it really more in that direction rather than um, sort of a process that that is supposed to deliver um, quicker enlargement or anything of that sort. And I don't think it's meant to be that, and I don't think it can be that. Uh, uh. Okay, I, uh, I think we, uh, we have four minutes left. Uh, I see three more hands raised, and I expect also a lot of um, French questions from, from, from those parts, so I would bundle those last three questions to our panel before I'm afraid we will have to, to end this discussion. But therefore, I would call Jana Idris, Jakob Ross, and then Verafine Dinkel for a very short, quick question. Please be short so we can we have enough time to answer those. Yeah, hello, good morning to everyone. I'm uh, Jana Idris, uh, editor at the communications department of uh, DGRP. Um, I have a question to uh, uh, for Christy, um, you uh, said before uh, you talked about the difference uh, between the uh, states participating uh, in this meeting and uh, uh, Russia uh, and uh, said that it, it's important to make this difference uh, to exclude uh, 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 Russia, for example. And I wanted to um, come back to, to the problem of, of Turkey and ask you what uh, you say about uh, uh, um, Turkey questioning um, uh, lately, uh, not only lately, the sovereignty of Greek islands and the conflict uh, that is uh, um, now uh, uh, going on between or has been going on for a while between uh, Greeks and Turkey and Turkey also questioning the sovereignty of other countries invading, for example, Syria, since we are talking about a problem of accepting the sovereignty of other countries um, concerning Russia and Ukraine, for example. Thank you very much. Jakob Ross, very short question. Yes, thank you to the panelists. My name is Jakob Ross. Uh, I'm working at DJP on, on France. And so uh, my question relates to France uh, this morning as well. I would be interested um, this morning, uh, the German Daily Die Welt titles uh, on the EPC that uh, this is Macron's vision for Grand Europe. So it's very much perceived, at least uh, in, in German media, still as a French project. Um, I guess my question would go first and foremost to, to uh, Christy Reich as well um, to, to ask you if the EPC is indeed uh, in Estonia, in Finland, in Eastern and Northeastern Europe uh, still perceived as a French uh, project and idea uh, or if uh, the Europeanization of, of this initiative has uh, succeeded and uh, with the Czech Council presidency taking over hosting this summit today this is becoming a European project indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Serafine Dinke. 
Hi, uh, good morning, Serafina Dinkel from also the German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, my question would be to Mr. Pisani Ferry um, about how to balance um, the value basis, for example, um, bindingness of uh, rule of law or democratic governance criteria um, for an NEPC in the future um, with short term or medium term interests such as energy security in the sense that the advantage of the EPC would be that it brings in these countries that don't necessarily adhere to um, to standards that the European Union would like to pose. So what would be the interest for those states to come into an EPC that um, that has stricter democratic governance requirements as you propose in your paper? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think we will we can start with you, Christy. We have the question on the French vision and Turkey as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I will start with the second uh, question. Um, yes, the EPC is very much uh, seen as the French uh, initiative. And uh, when it was initially proposed by, by France, uh, it did uh, cause um, uh, many questions and, and doubts. Um, but um, I must say also that uh, today um, we do have actually uh, support for this initiative uh, across the EU. Um, there are differences as to what uh, different member states expect from the EPC, what they want it to be, what they don't want it to be. Uh, but uh, I think this is about now the process of um, actually giving substance and shape uh, to the EPC that uh, now all the countries are taking part in this process. And uh, let's say the Estonian prime minister goes there with the primary interest in using this uh, initiative as one of the avenues for uh, further enhancing support to Ukraine. And this is the key issue. Some other countries may come uh, with uh, different uh, aims, um, but um, I, I do think in that sense, it is, um, it is now more than just a French initiative. And then when it comes to, to Turkey, um, as the APC focuses on security and, and uh, sends this message that uh, there are certain um, security norms, uh, respect for uh, sovereignty of each uh, European country um, and, and so on that need to be respected, of course, it is meant also to, to concern uh, Turkey. Um, but uh, whether the EPC is then the forum to um, go more in depth into the issues between Turkey and uh, Greece, uh, there I, I have my, my doubts. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would hand over to you, Jean, for, uh, for our uh, French question. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, it's, um, it may be perceived as a French initiative, but the initiative initially came from uh, Enrico Letta, um, you know, who, who first said um, the, 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 there needs to be a sort of a, uh, an intermediate structure between, between the EU as it is and the future uh, of the EU, because um, keeping the candidate country uh, in, in, a, in a protracted um, uh, accession course uh, could be could be dangerous. Uh, so it grew up, I think, of, uh, of th those various ideas. Um, the, the, the key question, I think, is the question uh, raised by, by Seraphine. I mean, you know, uh, uh, is it going to be, and perhaps also by, by, by Christine, who, which, who, who has a very clear vision of what the PC should be and what it shouldn't be, um, uh, I have a different view. I mean, in, in, in the paper, we, we're putting forward a different view. We're saying, you know, a pure uh, gathering uh, without uh, any sort of common values, without any common purpose, without any mechanism, without any way of 
the issuing even a statement because today's meeting will not uh, end up with a statement uh, would not lead uh, very far and it could uh, even disappoint those who who see it as a way to to solidify the alliance that exists against uh, the aggression um, the russian aggression on, on ukraine uh, i think um, uh, we have to sort of accept the, the the need and and the risk to go and uh, and test uh, on various basic principles the the willingness of, of countries participating to you know um, uh, say where they are on uh, some basic principle and some issues of geopolitical alignment um, uh, we're not saying that the eu should dictate uh, those terms but we say that this should be a process of elaborating those terms and having uh, a broad charter that uh, actually um, embodies those, uh, those values and, and geopolitical alignment. Thank you very much, John. We are a bit over time, and I think there are so many questions left uh, we would still like to answer, but I think we are well prepared to continue this discussion. Guntram. I would give you the, the opportunity for, for a 30 second uh, wrap, wrap up before. Um, we no, I mean, the uh, session. wonderful. Is, I mean, it's impossible to wrap up in 30 seconds, but just to say, I, I do agree with Jean that this should be probably a bit more than just just a gathering. So I wouldn't, I would be quite happy if there was a statement with some concrete deliverables and be that deliverables on on financial and weapon support for Ukraine. I mean, that would be a, or solidarity, at least uh, a, a solidarity that is being signed by those 44 heads of state towards Ukraine. I think that would be already quite powerful, but I don't think it can go in the direction of really being an institution um, that that really replaces um, uh, existing or complements existing institutions. I, I don't think that's what it is. Thank you very much. With those words, I think we will leave it here. I think we are all very curious to see what comes out of uh, yeah, the next uh, hours, the next days. Thank you so much for, for our guests and participants, and especially a great, great. thanks to our yeah. speakers. It was a great pleasure to be welcoming you here, and uh, I wish you all a happy day. Thanks a lot.